Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I will be your host. This is the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Degas, and Impressionism live stream program. Let's go ahead and get underway. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So if you want to let us know your first name, where you're connecting from, and who's your favorite artist and or type of art, you can let us know that in the Zoom chat or the Q&A or in the comments section if you're watching this on Facebook Live. We don't do a Zoom demonstration for these programs, but just very quickly, there's usually only a couple things that people ever have questions or concerns on. One is the sound and the other is the video display. So everyone will be in listen only mode or muted. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you can check the settings locally on your own device. If you want to adjust the screen display so that the slides that we show take up the full screen, if that's not currently happening for you because there's these black boxes that have my name, Robert Kellerman, in them, you can make those go away at your end by clicking on either view or view options, which is usually at the top of a person's device, and you can click off the side by side mode. If you want our program, if you have any technical problems, questions, comments, thoughts, opinions, ideas, perspectives, memories, et cetera, et cetera. Feel free to share those in the Zoom chat or the Q&A or the comment section on Facebook. One of my favorite parts of doing these programs is learning and hearing from all of you. So let's go ahead and get underway. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. I'm the founder and director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Nonprofit Organization. And we give people the opportunity to experience the history and culture, not only of Washington, D.C., but of the world. And today, we're going to make a trip, an online virtual trip, to New York City to go visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the world's great art museums. And this is a multi-part series we're doing on the Impressionists that are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Met has one of the best collections of Impressionist artwork in the world, uh, perhaps uh, in the top two, I would say, with the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And we did a previous program about a month and a half ago on Manet and Impressionism. Uh, we won't be hosting that one live again, but if you want to watch it, there's a recording of it on our YouTube channel, which I included that information when I sent out the Zoom link. Um, I'll also email that out a little bit later, just in case you want to check that out. Our next program that we're going to be doing, which we don't have the date for, probably either be in late December or early January, a uh, program just like this, but we'll focus on Renoir, so you can be on the lookout for that. Today, of course, we're going to be talking, though, about Edgar Degas and how he fits in with the overall Impressionist movement. The uh, reason why we're focusing on the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they have such an amazing collection of artwork. And they have so many works by Degas that you can do a whole separate program just on him from the collection that they have. Edgar Degas, born 1834. He lived a long life, passed away in 1917. He's most known for his dancer uh, works. Here are three examples for you to take a look at, but he did many other things besides dancers. So we'll be talking about that as time goes by today. I thought what I would do is put together just like a really brief synopsis of if you want to kind of dig out 101. Uh, these are the things that are kind of most important to know about him. His subject matter was dancers, of course, um, but he also spent a lot of time exploring the modern Paris life, the contemporary urban life of the city of Paris. So you can be on the lookout for that. In terms of the forms he used in creating art, he did oil painting. He also also did pastels, which was pretty unique. Not a lot of Impressionists did that. And also he did sculptures. Uh, most of the Impressionists that we're familiar with, like Monet and Van Gogh, they just strictly did um, oil paintings and various other painting forms. Uh, Degas, in fact, is perhaps his most well-known artwork, the dancer, was a sculpture. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. In terms of his style, uh, what makes a Degas a Degas? Uh, well, in addition to the dancers and modern Paris life subject matter, uh, two things to kind of be on the lookout for is the perspective that he used and then also cropping. Uh, we'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, also draftsmanship and color. And he didn't paint outdoors. That's one of the things that Impressionists were known for. Uh, that just wasn't his cup of tea, so to speak. 
he didn't consider himself an impressionist. In fact, he didn't even like that term. Uh, he considered himself what he called a realist uh, because he was depicting uh, the urban city life of Paris as it really was. Um, so that was a term that he preferred. Uh, on a personal note, he came from a very wealthy family that impacted his art. Uh, he had a very private life. Uh, he was never married. And as far as we know, he never had any children. So if you want to take a picture of that with your phone or a screenshot, um, these are kind of like the main things to know about Degas. And you'll see these items kind of pop up over and over again as we talk about his artwork. So a very diverse artist, not just a painter and sculptor of dancers. So what we'll do is we'll go through Degas' life and career in mostly a chronological order. And we'll focus on the works that are in the collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. If you haven't been to the Met before, I um, really encourage you to do so. They have an amazing collection of a wide variety of artists. Uh, the Impressionism collection is particularly strong and they just have a number of works by Degas, uh, including these. And so we'll be exploring these. We'll also take a look at some other Impressionist works that are in the collection at the Met, as well as some other Degas works that are at other museums throughout the world. So that'll be the focus of our program today. Here are some of the examples of some of the work we'll be seeing. We're gonna go through his life in mostly a chronological order. And those are some of the works. So let's go ahead and get underway. Of course, the most well-known work is his dancer sculpture. So let's begin. Let's talk about Degas' life from the earliest days. These are the three works of his from early years that we're going to be starting out with. Who is this guy? This is actually Degas. One of the things that's really uh, funny about artists is some of artists are really well known in terms of how they look like Vincent van Gogh, Frida Kahlo, Andy Warhol. Uh, Degas is a household name, but I'm guessing a lot of people don't know what he looks like. Um, so I always like to joke that, you know, at some point in time, they're going to invent time travel and we'll be able to go back in time and uh, visit places and see people. And so it would really be a bummer if you were walking down the streets of Paris and uh, Degas passed you by and you didn't even recognize him. So now you know what he looks like, at least as a young man. He did several portraits of himself in different forms. Oh, <laughs> Lorraine said he's good looking. <laughs> Thanks, Lorraine. <laughs> I'm sure he would appreciate that. Um, so kind of some information on the early years of his life. Again, he was born in 1834. He lived to be 83 years old. He came from a wealthy family and we'll explain why that was important in his artwork a little bit later. Uh, his father, was a banker. Uh, his mom was actually from New Orleans, so you might be surprised to know that one of the French Impressionists had American ancestry, um, so that's interesting. Uh, as a child, he often created drawings and paintings, and then in 1855, he dropped out of law school. His parents uh, wanted him to study law or medicine, and he initially started doing that, got very bored with law school, dropped out uh, ended up taking a trip to Italy, uh, and he ends up becoming an artist. So that's a little bit about his early background. And I wanted to include those points because a lot of those things will impact the artwork that he makes. So let's go dive into that. This self-portrait was done uh, right around the time he dropped out of law school in around 1855 or 1856. He's a young man of about uh, 22 or so, 21 or 22. Oh, I said earlier 1956. Of course, that was 1856. Sorry about that. Good catch. Thank you. Now, Degas is not the only one to do self-portraits. Perhaps the most famous Impressionist self-portrait at the Met is Vincent van Gogh's. Uh, so here's his work from 1887. And you kind of line those two up. And again, really fascinating. I'm guessing that if I walked up to 100 random people and showed them this slide here, that 99% of the people would recognize Vincent van Gogh on the right. And I'm guessing that very few number of people would recognize 
they got just for whatever reason, just not all that widely known, partially because he did do quite a few self portraits, but it wasn't really the main kind of focus of his artwork. Here is another image he did. This was a drawing from 1857. For some reason, he did about 25 or 30 self-portraits early in his career, and then he really kind of abandoned uh, that subject and ended up focusing on other things. But it's nice that they have two of his self-portraits at the Met, just so you can get a sense of what he looks like. Here's an early nude study that he did from 1856. So this is about a year after dropping out of law school. Degas early in his career spends a fair amount of time doing studies of the human form uh, to kind of perfect his skill, which would help him later on in his portraits and his depictions of dancers. This is while he's living in Italy. He was able to go to Italy and spend about two and a half or three years there uh, because his extended family was living in Italy. So he was basically able to go out and crash with them uh, and just go around and study art. Uh, it's not uncommon for artists or kind of um, uh, artistic type individuals to go to Italy at some point in time in their life and study classical Roman art, uh, study the Italian Renaissance, and Degas is able to go there and stay for an extended period of time. And he didn't have to get a job um, anywhere just because he was able to live with his family. This is a depiction of a local woman, and he's got her depicted kind of in traditional Italian clothing of the era. One of the things that's really fascinating about artwork is a lot of these artworks, we don't know who the people are. Um, so this older woman, perhaps she was a mother or someone's grandmother, um, and she perhaps had children and grandchildren that kind of went on uh, to go live their lives either in Italy or somewhere else. And, you know, it'd be so amazing, like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's actually uh, my great, great, great grandmother that Degas painted, but we don't know her identity, uh, which is the case, unfortunately, with a lot of well-known artworks. And I like this painting because uh, so many times artists will focus on depicting people that are young and beautiful, uh, which is fine, uh, but it's nice to see kind of different people being depicted. You don't necessarily have to be young and beautiful to be in a painting or an art form. And so it's nice here because she's very humble and graceful as she sits there kind of contemplating things. So a local woman that Degas depicted, um, she's got a Shaw, and we don't know her identity. And at this point in time, he's in Italy studying Michelangelo and Raphael and Titian uh, to kind of learn the, the ins and outs, so to speak, of the great Italian masters. Degas lived in Italy from 1856 to 1859. Uh, for our friends in America, just to give you historical context, the uh, American Civil War was fought between 1861 and 1865. Not that they anything to do with Degas. Um, so he was there of years prior to the Civil War, not that he had anything to do with the Civil War, but just to give you that kind of um, historical context. This is a really beautiful painting. This is from 1857 to 1858. One of the things about Degas that I didn't mention in the introduction is he was a real perfectionist and he would oftentimes rework uh, paintings that he did uh, subsequently. Sometimes he would even uh, give paintings to friends and then he'd visit them and see them on the walls of their home and ask them if he could take them back <laughs> to rework them. So he was a real perfectionist um, and you can get a sense of that here. Notice he worked on this painting from 1857 to 1858 and then two years later uh, he decided to work on it some more um, and so it's really kind of characteristic one of the things of him 
perfectionism. Um, and so this is also a painting of a local woman, uh, a local Italian woman. However, he's included a background which is not Italy. It kind of represents, say, the Middle East. Um, and historians think that he added that later. Uh, he also added the birds later for some reason. So kind of imagine initially this painting was just a woman with a shawl and kind of a plain background. Then later on, he decides to spruce it up, so to speak, um, by adding this Middle Eastern type background um, of an urban landscape, and then also adding the beautiful colored birds. And in a certain degree, this painting is not finished because he's provided quite a bit of detail on the birds, but he looks like he never really finished that. Um, and that's a characteristic that you see uh, quite a few Degas paintings where he was still working on them uh, when he ended up passing away. But a really beautiful painting, the colors of the red birds really kind of add a nice touch to the woman's clothing. And then the background, uh, the urban landscape gives it kind of an exotic feel. So interestingly enough, if you were to look at this painting when it was initially done, just the woman with the shawl, like, oh, okay, that's a nice portrait or a depiction of a local Italian woman. But then when he adds to it uh, with these other components, the background and the birds to give it this kind of exotic feel. So here are his early works. So at this point in time, Degas has only been painting for a few years after dropping out of law school. So if you were to look at these works, what do you think? Is this guy going to make it or not? <laughs> we'll say yes, of course. Let's look at some early portraits that Degas made. One of the things that's noteworthy about Degas is he came from a wealthy family, so he didn't have to rely on the sale of paintings to support himself, which is important because a lot of artists over the course of their careers will do portraits, uh, particularly around this era, to support themselves. Degas doesn't need to do that. Uh, he doesn't have to go out and find people to paint to make a living. Um, pretty much most of the portraits that he's doing are either friends of his or family members or um, artistic associates, things like that. So his portraits, um, while they're people, just like anybody else's portraits, the people that he's painting is different from say other uh, artists of his era. So some of the things to know about Degas' early portraits, um, he's back in France at this point in time. Um, these are pre-dancer paintings, and what I mean by that is uh, when he's doing these portraits I'm going to be showing you next, he hasn't gotten into the whole dancer thing uh, just yet, and these are also very different uh, from the dancer paintings we'll see in a little bit later. As mentioned, these aren't commissioned works. Um, he's not being hired to paint these people uh, just because of his family's wealth. He's doing portraits of friends, um, like art connoisseurs, artists, singers, musicians, writers. Um, he also did quite a few family members. I'm not going to show you any of those uh, particular works today. So he's hanging out with people that are very, say, cultured, uh, the art connoisseurs, the fellow artists, the singers, musicians, writers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, as I mentioned earlier, some of the identities of these paintings, the people are unknown. Like, for instance, this woman. So this is a really beautiful painting. It's called Portrait of a Woman in Gray, painted around 1865. What's fascinating about this is we don't know who she is. And for some reason, Degas never put this painting up for sale. It was in his studio when he died in 1917. So kind of interesting that he held on to this painting for about 52 years, uh, the last 52 years of his life. But yet, we don't know who she is. We don't have any information on her. Sometimes when an artist does a painting, they'll tell us who uh, the person is either in the title of the painting or they'll make notes uh, on the back of the uh, painting or they'll include information, maybe letters or correspondence that they've written, um, but that's not the case here. So we don't know who she is, but must have been someone um, that he knew uh, well enough to end up doing her portrait. And then interestingly enough that he kept this painting for 52 years. We don't know a lot about Degas' private life. He was very 
uh, or we don't know much about his personal life. He was very private. He did not like to discuss anything about his private affairs. Um, and that's one of the big mysteries about him is what exactly he was doing when he wasn't painting, but a nice portrait nonetheless. So here's another example. Perhaps this woman um, had children uh, either before this painting was done or afterwards, and then those children have uh, children themselves. And you know, wouldn't it be so cool if at some point in time through, I don't know, DNA or some other scientific advancement, they could track down who some of these people were and, oh yeah, yeah, that's my great, great grandmother that Degas painted when she was living in Paris. That would be really fascinating. Here is another unknown woman not sure her identity. This is from a little bit later, around 1875. This is a young woman with her hands over her mouth. And so she appears to be crying, um, but why she's crying or who she is, we have no idea, unfortunately. You can see the red coloring around her eyes. So who is she and why is she crying? We don't know. So if you are an artist and you're watching this program, you'll have to make sure you identify who these subjects are in your works so that people like me that are studying them later can figure out who these individuals are. Here's a close-up. So a very personal portrait. Now, here is another example. So this is, an interesting painting, uh, kind of an example of the people that Degas is hanging around with. This is called The Collector of Prints. It's from 1866. This was a friend of his and a fellow artist. Um, 1867, 1868. This artist actually has one of his most well-known paintings in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So here's the work. This is Degas' friend, the artist, and this is a painting that he made. He was not really an impressionist. He was more a realist. And you can see the two side by side. Just so. Here is another one of Degas' friends. This painting has an interesting story. So this is his friend Marie, and she was a pianist, a singer, and also a music teacher. And she actually met Degas for lunch one day. Um, and she was getting ready to head out of town. She was getting ready to board the train. And she had kind of like her... Uh, bag with her with her stuff that she's going to need and before she heads out Degas decides to make a quick portrait of her kind of as a gift um, so another example of the kind of uh, friends that he's hanging around with she's a pianist a singer a music teacher and he just put this portrait together quickly um, while they were meeting for lunch in a restaurant before she was about to board the train and head out of town uh, for extended trip she um had a lot of financial problems later in life. And so in the 1920s, um, she had held on to this painting because it was a gift from her friend Degas. But in the 1920s, she was having some financial problems and she ended up selling it to the Met um, and got you know a fair amount of money to kind of help sustain herself. So it was a very nice gift um, from Degas, her friend, uh, that she was able to cash in on to help support herself later on. Some of the paintings in the museum collections have interesting stories, not just the Met, but other museums as well. And this one also in that category. It's a small painting. It's only nine by 11 inches, but nice nonetheless. 
here is another friend of Degas. This gentleman was a musician. You can see there's a photographic portrait of him to compare on the right. So at this point in time, they have photography and artists uh, are still going about making painted portraits. So uh, take a look at this. They have photography. If you were getting your portrait done, which would you prefer at this point in time? Would you prefer the painted portrait by Degas or the black and white photo? Uh, I think a lot of people would prefer the painted portrait, which is why uh, they were still doing a lot of painted portraits even after the invention of photography. Photography, of course, uh, was easier to do. Uh, it took less time. Uh, it was less expensive. So if you wanted to hire someone to paint your portrait, um, it would cost a little bit of money. Now, Degas is doing this portrait, again, not to make money. He's just doing it as a, a favor for this friend of his who's the musician, his buddy Joseph. And one of the things about Degas is you frequently see friends of his popping up in paintings that he made. So this is one of his most well-known works that's not at the Met. Um, this is at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. This is the Orchestra of the Opera. This is one of his most famous paintings. And here's his buddy over here, the guy that we just saw in the portrait. So he included him in the painting. And they're side by side. He was a flutist, and then later he was the concert master of the Paris Opera. So a very important individual in the music scene of Paris at this point in time. And you frequently see that with Degas. He'll include figures that he's friends with, and sometimes even family members, um, in paintings like this. This painting has really um, stumped historians because of its title. It's called Sulking. Uh, it's from around 1870, but why Degas called it Sulking, <laughs> we have no idea. The woman depicted is a model friend of Degas, and the gentleman on the right is a writer friend of his. Um, so people aren't sure if these two were romantically involved, uh, or if there's some problem going on, who knows that he titled this painting Sulking for some reason. We know the identities of the two people, but we don't really know much beyond that. Um, here's a nice uh, horse race scene in the background. That's interesting. So another painting of Degas' friends. And this is perhaps his most well-known portrait of this early era. Uh, this is his, was one of his most famous paintings. And in fact, it's one of the most famous paintings uh, in Impressionism overall. If you had to make a list of, I don't know, top 100 most famous Impressionist paintings, uh, this would be a contender for that list. It's really beautifully done. And there's a lot going on with this one. So let's talk about this. Perhaps you've seen this one before. It's called Woman Seated Beside a Vase of Flowers. And we know her identity. She is the wife of one of Degas' childhood friends. Uh, Degas um, had a lot of friends, and so he would end up going and staying with his buddy that he knew from childhood. Um, they had a like a house out in the country, and he would go stay with them periodically. And at this point in time, he ends up doing this painting of his buddy's wife. And as you're looking at this, one of the kind of things that's uh, fun to think about is what do your eyes focus on when you look at this painting? Do they focus on the flowers, which is kind of the largest section of the painting, or do they focus on the woman, who usually our eyes do tend to focus on people because we're people ourselves, of course, or do your eyes kind of dart back and forth between the flowers and the woman? Uh, it's really kind of interesting to think about in that regards. And whatever the focus is for yourself, whether it's the flowers, the woman, or both, anyone is fine. Oh. <laughs> Arlene says she focuses on the wallpaper in the back. <laughs> Thanks, Arlene. That's funny. I'll have to include that as one of the options. <laughs> so here are 
the beautiful flowers. And look at that. If this was a painting just by itself, a uh, still life of these flowers, it'd really be spectacular. So you could look at all this incredible detail of the individual flowers and the petals. Uh, he's also got this nice pitcher of water over here. That's nicely done. Here's a close up. Really beautiful. And of course, Degas, not the only one at the Met who painted flowers. Uh, this guy named Vincent Van Gogh, he ended up painting some flowers himself. He did these irises in 1890 at the Van Gogh Museum. And then there's a similar one at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So you can see Van Gogh's flowers compared to Degas. So hmm, which one do you like the best or which one do you like best? Um, the Degas one is interesting just because he's included the woman um, in with the flower. So it's kind of like a dual purpose painting where in these two examples by Van Gogh, he focused on the flowers themselves. And then also the background. Uh, notice the background that Degas used a little more advanced as Arlene mentioned, uh, focusing on the wallpaper. Here is a portrait by Renoir. This is Renoir's girlfriend who later would become his wife. And this is a depiction of her by the seashore from 1883. So not uncommon for artists to do portraits of women, um, but look at these two side by side. This is interesting. So you have Degas in 1865, Renoir 1883. Um, now, notice how the focus of the painting on the right is the woman. Um, she's front and center. The background is kind of uh, blurred out to a certain degree. And 100% of our focus is on the woman on the right, whereas on the left, kind of bounces back and forth between the woman, the flowers, perhaps even the wallpaper. <laughs> um, so just really interesting how artists can kind of use uh, different techniques to get our eyes to focus on certain things. And as mentioned, this was a wife of one of his friends, looking very contemplative. In fact, what might she be thinking about? Um, they theorized that he painted this inside of a hotel. Um, so perhaps she's there waiting for someone. So there you go, some early portraits by Degas. And notice there's no dancers because he hasn't gotten to that just yet. We'll talk about that in the near future. Okay, speaking of dancers, let's talk about these dancers that Degas is known for. Here's some early dancer paintings of him. And when you leave today's program, you'll be able to tell if paintings of dancers by Degas are early works or later works, and how can you tell? Well, uh, let's go into that. So Degas dancers rehearsing, uh, dancers is a signature subject. He doesn't start doing these until 1870. In fact, this is one of his earliest painting of dancers. Uh, if you're looking at these, they're typically almost always rehearsing and not performing on stage. And so the picture on the left is a great example. And also too, something to kind of consider is how we've romanticized the role of dancers and our perception of the dancers is a little bit different than their actual lives that they led at that point in time. So let's talk about that. This is the dancing class from 1870, one of his earliest dancer works. So this is very characteristic of Degas in the sense that here's dancers, but they're not on stage performing, they're practicing or rehearsing. And this is something that he would do time and time again. He's got a lot of really interesting details in this painting. Um, he's got the violin player and his top hat. He has some sheet music in the top hat. Uh, this is a water canister. They would sprinkle water on the floor so that dust wouldn't raise up. And Degas frequently includes mirrors 
um, in his paintings, which is not unique to him, but he does it a lot more often than any other artist. So if you ever see an Impressionist painting and it has a mirror in it and you know, it's a multiple choice question, you have to guess who the artist is. If you guess Degas, you probably have a good chance of getting it correct because he's not the only one to include mirrors in his paintings, but he does it a lot more than uh, the average artist does. And you know, nicely so, because to include this mirror here, um, and these extra figures would have taken a lot of extra work. It would have been much easier for him just to paint this kind of a brownish background uh, and skip this, but he decides to include that, which is a nice touch. Here is a close up. Oh yes, windows too. So that's a good, who mentioned that? That was Arlene again. Arlene mentioned also to look out for windows. Yes, he also includes uh, windows frequently in his paintings. We'll actually see that in just a minute. So thanks Arlene, appreciate that. Again, a lot of nice details here with the violin player. Uh, you have his top hat with the sheet music. There's some other papers up here. Uh, this watering can, the violin case. You know, he could have easily just left all that stuff out. It would have made it the painting uh, much less work for him to complete, but these touches do add a nice feel to it. Um, it's interesting looking at the dancers, what they're doing. Uh, these two over here are kind of waiting their turn. I would imagine. So there's kind of chattings amongst themselves. Uh, these two are kind of checking out <laughs> their counterpart over here. Um, this young girl, she's adjusting her costume. And then this guy just kind of playing along with this violin music. And here's the center figure. And you also have these ones in the back. And then over here, <laughs> kind of off to the side. So a lot of interesting details in this painting. So just kind of a hint um, when we talk about this moving forward, one of the things that's characteristic of Degas' early dancer paintings is he frequently has a number of dancers in the work. Actually, let me go back. So notice how all of these paintings have a lot of dancers in them. Um, that's really characteristic of his early works. Later on, I think he just came to the conclusion that, gosh, this is just too much work. Um, so if you see a Degas painting, it has a lot of dancers in it. It's probably from the early to mid 1870s. If you see it and it just has like one or two or three dancers, it's from probably from the mid 1870s on. Just kind of a hint. Um, what we'll talk about later, let me go back to our painting. Here's another example. These are actually two different paintings that he did that are very similar and they're both at the Met. This one is called the rehearsal of the ballet on stage done sometime around 1874, one of his most well-known works. And this is called the rehearsal on stage also from around 1874. Historians have been really uh, stumped as to which one of these he painted first and why he did two different versions. Uh, it's, kind of evenly split. Half the people think that he did the one on the left first, uh, the other for various reasons. Uh, the other group of people think that he did the one right for various reasons. I'm not really sure. And to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter that much to me because they're both done around the same time. But historians like to have all that kind of stuff figured out. So let's look at these two. Here's the first one. And again, a lot of dancers depicted here. Uh, there's a lot going on in terms of the activity taking place. Here is a close up. This is interesting. You got the girl yawning <laughs> or singing, depending on your perspective on things. And the beautiful colors. Interesting. We talked, uh, we'll talk more about this later, but one of the things about Degas' work is cropping, um, oftentimes unusual. So you would think that, you know, we might not like the fact this woman, half of her, or girls, half of her face is chopped off, but Degas' not really um, concerned with that. So cropping is kind of another thing to be on the lookout for in his artwork. Here is the other version. Notice this one, he decided to have uh, the figure on the far left facing the other direction. It's also got this section of the double bass musical instrument sticking out from the bottom. If you were thinking, if you wanted this to be like a perfectly um, set up perspective, you probably wouldn't want this 
double base uh, sticking out into the photo. Uh, you'd want to crop this, so you either included this girl or not. Um, kind of same thing back here. Here's double base again. Uh, and then we've kind of cut off this woman's face. So again, again, kind of the perspective and the cropping of Degas' work, one of the things to be on the lookout for. Really beautifully done with the colors. And so it's easy to look at these paintings and think, wow, these are really beautiful. The dancers, they're so graceful and elegant. But there is kind of a hint of something sinister going on uh, in these works. And let's talk about that. Do you see anything unusual uh, about these paintings? Hmm. No, it just looks like some dancers practicing. Interesting side-by-side -side comparison. Notice they're very similar. Uh, he just has made a few subtle differences with the, uh, the leftmost figure facing us and then back turned to us. Uh, he adjusted the musical instrument a little bit. And here's kind of the dark side to this painting. So the dancers are really romanticized today. Um, we kind of think of them as uh, elegant and graceful, which they were. But one of the realities, the harsh realities of life in Paris is this was a very difficult um, profession for young girls. Typically, um, these girls would have to drop out of school to be these dancers. They didn't really receive very much money. Um, now, I don't have children myself, but I kind of get the impression that people that get involved in dancing oftentimes take dance lessons, things, and you have to pay money for that, and you tend to maybe have upper middle class or a wealthier uh, background. These girls of this era in Paris were typically from poor homes, um, uh, working class families, uh, things like that. The patrons that would attend these performances were typically um, middle-aged or older men that were very wealthy. Um, and they're depicted by these guys over here. So this is kind of the dark side of this painting. And Degas kind of interjected them uh, just to kind of show this reality. And so if you take um, these patrons of the opera uh, or the ballet, they would oftentimes have like a subscription, they'd be like a sponsor or a member. And one of the privileges that they would have is they could come hang out like backstage um, and see things that the general uh, population wouldn't be able to see. So you combine the fact that you have young girls um, from very poor or modest backgrounds, uh, struggling financially with uh, combined these guys that are uh, middle-aged or older, very wealthy, and you can kind of extrapolate out what kind of situations those might end up leading to. And so interestingly enough that Degas has included these figures uh, in his paintings. And he does this uh, quite often. It's kind of something to be on the lookout for, these male figures kind of lurking around um, in the background of some of these paintings, which you might not uh, notice right off the top, but it does kind of represent the reality of life in Paris for these girls and the very difficult lives that many of them had. So a little bit different than kind of like the romanticized version of the dancers that we have today. And, but that might not be like readily apparent if you were to look at this uh, just initially. So something to keep on lookout for, we'll actually see examples of that again in the future. But a beautiful painting or set of paintings nonetheless Oftentimes in this era, the era of Impressionism and years and centuries prior, um, artists would focus on what was known as history paintings, depicting some great historic event. Uh, like this is the famous artist David, and this is one of his most well-known paintings, The Death of Socrates, so a very important historical event. So before Impressionism, this would have been like the highest art form, making these historical depictions of some significant event like a battle or a death of a person or a coronation. If you were with our um, program yesterday when we had on the Louvre, we were talking about the coronation of Napoleon. Um, well, here's kind of a similar historic event. So at this point in time, prior to Impressionism, history painting is kind of the dominant art form. But when you have people like uh, Degas and the other Impressionists, 
they don't care about history painting. They don't, they're not focused on this stuff that happened back in the time of Socrates uh, and things like that. They're focused on the present. And so Degas painting, um, while it may not seem all that unusual to us now, was really kind of a break with tradition because the, again, the highest art form of artists before Impressionism would have been history paintings and depicting these great scenes from history, like the death of Socrates, whereas uh, artists like Degas and Van Gogh and Monet and Renoir and Manet, they're focused on depicting the kind of modern contemporary uh, urban city life of Paris. And that's what's taking place here on the right. This is a dance class. This isn't something that happened a uh, hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. It's happening right now, uh, the time that Degas is painting this. Uh, you can tell also too, there's a number of dancers in, or a number of figures, dancers and otherwise in this painting. So very ambitious. There's our mirror again, that I was talking about. And then as Arlene mentioned, uh, you also frequently have windows in Degas painting. And even though we can't see the window, uh, we can see the reflection out the window uh, in the painting. And also too, just because there's so many figures in this work, you can tell this is a kind of one of his earlier dancer paintings. This has a similar version that's at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. So there's two very similar paintings. These are two of Degas' most well-known works. And here they are side by side. So this one on the left is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. This one is at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Um, notice there's a few differences. Um, on the one hand, look at the floorboards. Over here, they're horizontal. And over here, they're vertical. Um, kind of similar to the previous set we saw this one the figure is facing us. This one, she's turned away from us. This one has a very prominent kind of central figure uh, that's being watched by this guy. And then this one, her role is a little less pronounced. And then also the cropping. So he has a lot more figures in the background of this one than he does in this one. So really interesting to look at these two paintings side by side. Both of them are really spectacular um, and quite a few subtle differences between the two of them though. This is the person being depicted in the painting. This is another one of Degas' friend. This is Jules Perrault. He initially was a very successful and famous dancer in his own right. Um, but then later on, he kind of retired from that aspect of the business and became the Paris Opera's choreographer. So he's in charge of kind of choreographing all these different um, activities that are taking place at the opera. He was good friends with Degas. And that's him being depicted over here on the right. So he's basically conducting a class here. And another example of Degas showing us dancers, but they're not on stage performing. They're practicing and rehearsing. There's the figure again. This has an interesting um, perspective on how your eye flows. Sometimes artists will look to set up their works in a pyramid form. Uh, we've talked about that in some of our other programs, but uh, Degas doesn't have the pyramid here per se. It's got kind of more of a diagonal flow from left bottom to top right. So that's interesting. Here's a close up of the leftmost part of the work. Um, again, a really lot of neat touches that he includes that he could have easily left out. Like for instance, he includes the musical instrument here. Um, he includes this poster over here, of course, the mirror with the reflection of the window. So he adds a lot of really nice touches. Um, this goes with before what we were talking about, Degas, the perfectionist. He wants it to look a certain way, um, and he's willing to take the time to make it look that way, uh, whereas somebody else might be more apt to just say, oh, to heck with it, this is good enough and kind of move on. His financial status allowed him to do that more so. If you think about yourself, um, like say in your job, um, there might be times where you're working on some project, you'd like to have more time to work on it, but you're under a deadline and you gotta 
get it to your boss or whatever. And so you just wrap it up and move on to the next thing. Because Degas uh, had financial resources available to him, he can take his time and set up these paintings the way he wants to. So that's one uh, kind of way that his financial background impacted his style. If this was someone that was making this painting, say, for a commission that they needed to pay their rent, uh, they might be more apt to just kind of skip some of these details and crank it out so they can get on to the next painting after they collect their fee. The mirror is just such a really nice touch, um, including in there, and then as mentioned, Arlene mentioned earlier, the window. And then in the background here, you have all these women. So these are like the um, older sisters or more likely the mothers of the dancers um, that are kind of accompanying them to these uh, classes and rehearsals, and while the dancers are performing, uh, they're kind of sitting around and chatting amongst themselves. And so it looks like here, he, the choreographer, is critiquing uh, this one girl's movements, and the other ones are kind of waiting for their turn uh, in front of him to kind of get uh, coaching from him. And there's the two side by side. So a lot of similarities, but yet also a few differences between these two paintings, the Metropolitan Museum of Art version on the left, the Musée d'Orsay version on the right. So these early dancer paintings characterized by um, practicing and rehearsing and a lot of figures, um, that's something that noteworthy of the later ones. So Degas just did not do depictions of dancers. He frequently focused on what would be we'd call modern or contemporary uh, city and urban life in Paris. And what do you mean by that? Well, he's focusing on things that are taking place uh, at that time, not history subjects. Um, he's doing depictions of people in urban environments, in the city, uh, not out in the countryside or in farms. Um, he has people at work laundry, work, ironing, things like that. He also depicting people at play, attending the opera, the ballet, horse racing, even going shopping. Uh, and as mentioned before, one of the things to look for in Degas' work is the unique perspective in cropping. Here are the works we'll take a look at from this era. Degas was fascinated by people that worked and depicting them in their professions. And so this is a woman ironing um, before the advent of washers and dryers, uh, which is perhaps one of the greatest inventions in history. Um, a lot, it was a, quite a lot of manual labor to do laundry, sometimes say like a housewife before the invention of the washer and dryer and kind of like the mid 1900s, at least here in the United States. Um, it was not uncommon for housewives to have to spend a whole entire day doing nothing per week, doing nothing but laundry. And a lot of wealthy people had someone that their job was nothing else than doing laundry um, all the time, washing and ironing. And so you see Degas and many of the other Impressionists um, depicting this work form, kind of giving it a um, somewhat um, you know, a certain amount of stature. These people kind of are very anonymous uh, in the life of Paris at this point in time. They're kind of working behind the scenes um, for these different upper middle class and wealthy individuals and families doing their laundry for them. And Degas and other Impressionists kind of capturing uh, the essence of this work. So you have this woman here ironing. He would frequently depict women working. I mean, if you think about the dancers, those are actually women that are working, right? Uh, their profession is dancers, but he's also doing uh, these laundresses and women ironing, also dressmakers, people working in hat shops and things like that. We don't know her identity. He was fascinated by people that did this work because it requires a lot of movement. If you think about ironing, your arms and your body is kind of constantly on the go much like it is for dancers. So that was one of the things that attracted him to this type of profession per se. And also interesting how he set this painting up. It's almost like a silhouette. You have this very dark figure here and this very light background. Interesting setup there, but a nice scene of modern Paris life. You don't see many people anymore that they're 
job is ironing or laundry or things like that. But this was a very common profession, particularly in urban areas of the time. This is a famous painting at the Met by Manet of his friend Monet in their garden at Argentoy from 1874. This was a painting that was done outdoors by Manet, um, but that was not Degas thing. He did do some depictions of scenes outdoors, but he typically would not paint outdoors. He would make drawings and sketches outdoors. Uh, but almost all of Degas' paintings were done in a studio, which is different than many of the other Impressionists who worked outdoors. Um, here's another kind of well-known scene from urban life. This is Manet's boating painting from 1874. Another great outdoor work. And so one of the characteristics of Impressionism is kind of these scenes, let me go back, are these scenes of leisure. So you have these people are kind of out enjoying a day in the garden. Uh, these two people are out enjoying a day boating. And Degas is going to give us some depictions of people enjoying themselves as well. This is a scene from the ballet from 1871. Let's skip over that. So one of the things that's funny about this one, this is one of the few Degas paintings that actually has performers on stage performing. Um, but that's not really the focus of the painting. Look at all these guys here and notice that none of them are really even paying attention to the opera. Um, so these two folks have their heads turned. Um, these two guys are talking. This guy is like looking through these binoculars <laughs> off into the distance. And so one of the things of this era of going to the ballet or the opera or other things like that, are you going there to see, as in see the performance, or are you going there to be seen? It was one of the big social uh, events and activities was to attend ballet and opera performances so you could socialize with other people. And so if I had to guess, um, I'm thinking this guy in the center with the opera glasses has perhaps seen some young lady who's caught his attention um, and he's glancing up towards her. If I had to guess, that's a kind of a common theme you see in Impressionist painting. There he is. But he's no doubt observing somebody doing something as opposed to looking at the performance. Here is horse racing. Horse racing became really popular in Europe during the early and mid 1800s. Uh, it was a pastime of the wealthy go to these events. Now, at least in the United States, we kind of think of like horse racing as, you know, a guy going at the track and he's betting, you know, five or 10 bucks on who's going to win the horse race. Uh, it was a really different atmosphere in Paris in the mid to late 1800s. A lot of wealthy people would go to horse racing and see these different events. And so Degas, who liked to attend horse racing events himself, uh, would frequently depict this. He was interested in the movement of the horses, just the way he was interested in the movement of the dancers. And then the dancers typically had very colorful costumes. Well, so did the jockeys of the horse races, their silks, as they're oftentimes called. So here's a poster of a horse race. So very popular pastime. So again, kind of the takeaway here, one of them, is that he's attracted to the horse racing subject because the colorfulness or the colors of the riders' uniforms, just like he was the colors of the dancers' outfits, and then also the movement of the horses and the riders and the movement of the dancers. So kind of horse racing, similar to dancers, uh, in capturing Degas' imagination, so to speak. He did a number of equestrian-type scenes during his career. This is at the Milliners. If you're not familiar with the term milliner, that's a hat shop. So this is from 1882, another scene of urban life, shopping in Paris. 
Now, the woman on the left, do you recognize her? Because she's really famous. I'm guessing once I tell you her name, you'll like, oh yeah, I know who she is. But do you recognize her just by looking at her face? Who do you think that is? Why, it's Mary Cassatt, the famous artist. Um, so Mary Cassatt was a friend of Degas. Uh, a lot of the Impressionists um, are friends with one another. And so Cassatt and Degas had a long friendship. Um, this is a portrait of herself that she did that's also at the Met that you can go see. This is a portrait of her by Degas that's at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. It's one of the few artworks that's by a non-American artist um, in the Smithsonian. And the reason why it's in the Smithsonian because the subject, Mary Cassatt was an American. So that's why it gets included there. Uh, Mary Cassatt, a great artist. Uh, another person that perhaps people don't really recognize her um, looks just because they just know uh, her name, but this is her over here. And this is her self-portrait at the Met. And this is Degas' portrait of her at the Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Sometimes Mary Cassatt would pose for Degas in different works that he did. So here she's at the hat shop trying on a hat. The sales clerk over here has two other options for her uh, in case she's not happy with that one. Now, another interesting thing about Impressionism, particularly with Degas, is the perspective that they use. So notice, remember before there was the paintings where he had chopped off the person's face or kind of cropped out half of them. He's kind of done the same thing here, only the cropping or the kind of exclusion is because of the mirror. So we can't see who she is. And, you know, so why is he doing that? Does he not want to show us her face because she's in the witness protection program? No, uh, it's just that he's not really concerned that he, he wants to include her um, by showing us the fact that she has these two extra hats, um, but he doesn't want us to focus on her. He wants us to focus on this figure over here. So he uses this kind of unique perspective um, to portray that. You would think if maybe in a more, I don't know, normal type of portrait, he'd move her over to the left or the right so we could actually see her. But if he did that, um, we, our eyes would kind of be going back and forth where he really wants the focus to be on her. So really interesting perspective is one of the characteristics of Degas' work. Chris said, perhaps the woman on the right is just shy. <laughs> you might be right. Yeah, she doesn't want to be depicted in the painting. Yeah, I'll, I'll pose for you, Degas. Just don't show my face. <laughs> um, here is another famous painting by Degas. This is also at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And here is another one that's famous of his at the Hermitage in Russia. So two other famous Degas paintings, this one. And this one, and let's compare those two to this one, which is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, the milliner term is a hat shop. You don't really use that too much anymore, at least not here in the United States. This one also is interesting in terms of the cropping because if you were to look at this painting, it might not initially look all that kind of um, unusual or different, but if you were to kind of set this up perfectly, like in a more traditional form, they would crop this um, because this is really kind of, I don't wanna say wasted space, but it's not really, um, like the focus of the artwork, the two figures are. So we think a more traditional kind of um, composition would be this one over on the right, but that's not what Degas does. Um, he's including this extra space over here. So it's kind of characteristic of Degas, the cropping, either adding space or taking away space. And we saw the cropping before, remember kind of cutting off this figure And you can kind of see the same thing here. So this perspective where um, we've blocked her out um, and the cropping, we've added this, we've cut off this. So if you're looking at kind of things that are characteristically Degas, um, these aren't 
completely unique to him. Other artists, including other Impressionist artists do this, but the cropping and the perspective is one of the things that's a very common characteristic of his. So if you see an Impressionist painting for the first time that you're not familiar with and you're trying to guess who the artist is, if there's kind of something going on with the cropping or the perspective, um, it may be a Degas. And remember before we were talking about history paintings and artists prior to Impressionism focusing on these great historical events like battles and coronations and uh, deaths of people and things like that. Um, here, Degas is just depicting women out shopping for hats. Um, so a depiction of modern or contemporary urban city life in Paris at this point in time, something Degas is focused on. And you can see that with these works. So not just dancers, these works of uh, this Paris life of this day at this point in time when Degas is alive is probably the second most common subject matter for his after the dancers. Okay, let's look at more dancers rehearsing. So these are the works we're gonna look at now, these seven. So paintings from this era, again, dancers is Degas' signature subjects. These works we're gonna be looking at are from the late 1870s and beyond. The earlier works we saw were from the early and mid 1870s. Uh, again, the dancers are rehearsing, they're not performing. Um, he's kind of giving us a hint of the romanticism of the dancers, um, but also a little bit of the, the dark side, so to speak. Um, paintings from this era, there's just individual dancers or small groups of dancers, whereas the earlier ones, there were lots of dancers in the paintings. And these ones also to kind of more private, intimate moments as opposed to the group scenes we saw earlier. So remember, these were the paintings we saw before. And notice how many dancers were in all these paintings. These were very ambitious works uh, with a lot of activity taking place. And you contrast these four from the early and mid 1870s with these works from the late 1870s and beyond. And you can see the difference. Notice there's sometimes just one dancer um, and maybe at the most five, um, but usually just one or two figures. And so much more personal moments, uh, kind of much more individualized focus. So again, earlier works and the later works. And so these are just the dancer paintings at the Met. There are hundreds and hundreds of dancer paintings throughout the world. So next time you go see one, you should kind of take a look at it and say, hey, is there a bunch of dancers in the painting? Thus making it an early for one of his works. Or is there just one or two people or a few? Okay, let's look at these dancers practicing. Uh, again, the focus on not performing on stage but practicing or rehearsing you have the water can over here is a nice touch notice how the pose or the like the position of the water can kind of the diagonal here is very similar to this one girl's leg and her arm uh, so really interesting kind of comparison there the arm and the leg forming a triangle uh, the same as the position of the watering can that's interesting Here's a close up. Oh yeah, Roz wanted to point out he used pastels a lot. Um, thanks Roz, I appreciate you reminding me of that. So Degas does use pastels a lot. Um, most Impressionism do the majority of their work in oil paints. Some would do um, other forms as well, but Degas, was using pastels a lot, which is kind of like a, a, a chalk type item. We'll talk more about pastels in a little bit, um, but something to kind of keep on lookout for him. Here's another one, the dance lesson from 1879. Again, you just have the one solitary dancer accompanied by a musician. Degas' works typically are kind of giving the 
depiction that it's a very um, brief moment in time, they like to call it, where it's just, okay, this one dancer performing at this one moment in time. However, they got, because he was such a perfectionist, he would make a lot of effort to get the works done exactly the way he wanted it to. So this is a good example. This is a study for the dance lesson. This is the violin player. And a lot of times when an artist is gonna do a painting, they'll just immediately start putting paint on the canvas and they'll continue on until they're finished. Sometimes though, they'll do preliminary paintings or drawings or sketches. And so uh, if you're looking at this, Degas would really put a lot of time and effort and really think out how he wanted things. And so this is a great example. He's taken time here to create this initial sketch of the violin player because he wants to make sure he's got it absolutely right before he ends up putting it into the finished painting. Um, so here is that version. Not all artists do it. It's not uncommon for artists to do preliminary works, um, but some do and some don't. And here is an example of Degas putting that together. Notice he's kind of tweaked a few things. Like for instance, we were talking before about the cropping. Um, the initial work that he did had some space over here between the gentleman's head and the edge. And he decided in the finished painting to eliminate that. Even when the works, when there's more than one dancer, oftentimes the emphasis is on one in particular. So this is a good example. There's four dancers in here, uh, but our eyes focus on the central figure. This is from around 1880. So this is about 10 years after he started making the dancer works. He's like the scenes of the horse jockeys, really interested in the colors, got this beautiful blue slash here, um, and then the nice lightish blue colors of her outfit. Notice not on stage, but practicing and rehearsing. Dancer in green. Really does a great job of capturing the, the gracefulness uh, and the elegance of the dancers. It's kind of amazing to me personally that Degas was able to capture uh, how elegant and graceful these dancers were. And when he was a man and not a dancer himself, uh, you would look at this. I would tend to think that someone that made this painting had danced themselves or perhaps was even a woman uh, just because the way he's captured things, not just in this painting, but in other ones that he's done. Um, but that's not the case at all. He was just a great admirer of the dance form. And he ended up doing about half of his works during his career were of dancers. Beautiful colors. This one, they're not sure the date on. This also is a pastel. <laughs> Degas frequently used pastel, much more so than any other uh, Impressionist artist. As mentioned before, most Impressionists um, do the majority of their work in oil paint. And Degas did do a lot of oil paintings, but he frequently would do pastels, particularly for the dancers. He liked the kind of the colors uh, that he could achieve from that work. We'll explain more about what pastels are in just a little bit. This is one of his most well-known dancer works. This is the singer in green, a solitary figure. She looks remarkably similar to the famous dancer sculpture. More about the dancer sculpture later on.
just really beautiful coloring on these, not just in their clothes, um, but also in the background, uh, complementing the blues and the greens, the oranges and the yellows of her outfit with the background. So this is Dancers Pink and Green, circa 1890. And look at this painting, and do you see anything unusual about it? Hmm. What do you think? I think? If you were to first glance at this and just kind of focus on the, the beautiful colors, uh, the oranges and the greens, really captures your eyes. Um, for our friends in Washington, DC, this coloring uh, of this painting is very similar to this large dancer painting that they had at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. I forgot to include um, this picture of that, but you might know the one I'm referring to if you've been to the National Gallery of Art before, just this greenish-orange coloring. But this also has a little bit of a dark side to it. We'll talk about that in just a second. Here's a close-up of the bottom, and really beautiful, these green colors, translucent green. Now, what you might not have first noticed about this one, similar to the two paintings we saw earlier, look at this. This is a foot, and this is a figure here with a top hat. Um, so that might not be easily recognizable because he kind of blends into the shadow. But uh, again, you have these young girls. Uh, they're often from very poor, um, modest working class families um, trying to support themselves, trying to become professional dancers. Um, they've dropped out of school. And you have these very wealthy men that are the patrons. And if you made a certain amount of financial contribution to the opera or the ballet, you got what they called backstage kind of privileges or behind the scenes. And so this guy is just basically kind of lurking around back here, uh, watching these girls dance and practice and things like that. So really kind of uh, eerie or creepy that uh, Degas is including this. And again, it kind of goes back to that. We have this kind of romantic vision of the dancers as, uh, now. Um, and that was somewhat the case back then too, although kind of behind the scenes, so to speak, there was this other kind of sometimes illicit activity taking place, unfortunately. This life was not as glamorous um, for these young girls as it would appear in some of these paintings. And sometimes Degas gives us kind of hints um, of that or clues of that. So here were the earlier dancer works. and the later ones. Okay, let's talk about pastels more. Um, Degas did a whole series of nude pastels. Here are four examples. They actually have quite a few of these at the Met. I'm just giving you four examples to take a look at. So we talked about pastels before, thanks to Roz for reminding me. Um, if you've heard that term before, but not exactly sure what a pastel is, here you go. This is actually uh, one of Degas' boxes of pastels. It's kind of a type of crayon made of colored pigments bound with gum or resin. So you can see here, this is actually one of Degas' boxes of pastels that they discovered in his studio when he passed away. And so you can see, look at all these beautiful colors um, that you can use. And that's how he ended up making a lot of these great artworks, especially a lot of the dancers uh, were with pastel forms like this. And so Degas ended up doing this whole series that he called his suite of nudes. Um, and they're the most part, they're these bathers in very private moments. Um, what did critics think of these works? 
Oh, well, they thought they sucked. <laughs> they did not like them at all. We'll explain why that in just a minute. Uh, but it had mostly to do with the fact that they were in very kind of non-classical poses. They were very kind of awkward, so to speak, like a woman getting into a bathtub. Um, for Degas, then creating these, they had kind of like a very voyeuristic type of approach to them. Um, they weren't kind of posing in the traditional form. Um, and as much as critics of Degas' time hated these works, uh, a lot of other artists after the fact um, and uh, historians and things like that really like him a lot because they think that he did uh, a great job in kind of breaking from the traditional poses that were so characteristic of the day. So let's talk about that. So in terms of nudes, that's a common subject in the history of art. This is a famous painting at the Met by Titian, um, you can see it's from around 1565 or 1570, so about 300 years before Impressionism. And this woman is in kind of a very traditional pose. It's very standard, kind of leaning back, reclining. Um, so it's kind of typical that way you would see uh, women, particularly nudes, uh, being depicted for centuries and centuries. And you compare that with Degas work and you can see the difference. So the one big reason why the critics of the day um, didn't like these works is just notice the difference, how kind of elegant and graceful this pose is. And over here, you know, you have women bending over and they're getting into bathtubs and stuff. And um, so people just did not like that. They just thought it was too weird or too unconventional, so to speak. But for Degas, it was like, hey, this is what people do. This is how they bathe themselves, or this is how they get in and out of the tub, or this is how they uh, dry their hair. So he wasn't really focused on uh, trying to uh, keep with tradition. And so the critics of the day, thought that this was a terrible idea. Uh, a lot of artists, though, were really inspired by the, like, oh, you know, he's really onto something. And, you know, it may not seem like that big of a deal to us now that someone is going to break from tradition and do something different, because we kind of live in an era where people try new things a lot. Um, but in the time of Impressionism, people had just been making art kind of in very similar ways and styles and uh, things like that for centuries. And so for someone to break from that and go do something different, while that might not seem very radical to us now, in Degas' time, that was very uh, unusual, very controversial, and got him a lot of scorn. Also interesting in these is typically the women are very anonymous. We don't know who any of these women are. They're all facing away uh, from us. Um, so we don't know uh, much about their identity. Um, historians have theorized that perhaps these were prostitutes that Degas hired to pose for him. Um, and they're just all in very intimate moments. There's um, not any kind of like uh, erotic activity taking place. These are just women kind of going about their day-to-day -day, uh, activities of bathing or doing their hair and things like that. He, Degas himself, said he wanted these paintings to look like, quote, as if you looked through a keyhole. Uh, you might not be familiar with the keyhole concept, but back in the day when they <laughs> doors on locks, there used to be a little hole that you would insert the key in and it would usually go all the way through the door and you could sometimes peek in and see stuff. They don't really have that anymore. They have more advanced locks. This is a woman bathing in a shallow tub woman combing her hair. Bather stepping into a tub. And woman with a towel. So there's quite a few of these different pastels, um, this suite of nudes, so to speak, in the Met collection. And there's also many of these works at other museums throughout the world. I'm just kind of giving you four examples that are kind of characteristic of this particular subject for Degas. These are noteworthy also, too, in the fact that the colors are much lighter um, than you see in contemporary artworks of the day. And so you just basically have these women bathing, washing themselves, combing their hair, having their hair combed, getting dressed, stuff like that. Okay, we're getting into the home stretch. I think we have three more artworks to look at. Here's the next two. 
these also are dancers, although they're Russian dancers. So um, one of the things about Russia and France is those two countries have a long history uh, together, and there's been a lot of cultural exchange between those two. There was a uh, kind of like a political alliance that was formed between Russia and France in the 1890s. And consequently, you have a lot of cultural exchange taking place between those two countries. So there's a lot of French stuff in Russia. There's a lot of Russian stuff in France. And so this is a good example. This was a troupe of dancers. These dancers were actually Ukrainian, um, but sometimes people um, not from Russia or Ukraine kind of use those terms interchangeably, even though uh, Russians and Ukrainians are very different. Uh, so this, this is called Russian dancers, but they're actually Ukrainian dancers. And here on the right is a picture of a more modern woman dressed in the traditional Ukrainian style. You can see the clothing similarities, the white blouse, uh, the flowers and the hair, the necklaces. And that you can't see as much on the photo below are these colored skirts. And so just with his other dancer paintings or with the horse racers, he's really interested in the colors and the movement. And these Ukrainian dancers gave him an opportunity to kind of explore those subjects, but in a different outlet. One of the things that's also noteworthy about Degas works is the draftsmanship. So he started out drawing and you see this, it's not unique to him, um, but you don't see this in all ours. There's a lot of lines. And so he typically would draw the lines out first and then fill in the coloring later, which again, that's not unique to him. A lot of artists do the same thing, but a lot of artists don't do that. Um, a lot of artists just make the painting the way it is, but he took the time to draw that out. And so this is really a great example of the draftsmanship. If you see that, you can see a lot of black lines um, to help kind of define the colors, uh, make them more uh, intense, then also define the subject matter. But notice this, all the different black lines on here that he's included. So that's another characteristic of Degas' work to be on the lookout for. If you see black lines in a painting, it's not guaranteed it's going to be a Degas because so many other artists did that. But one of the things that he frequently did. Here is another example, Russian dancer. There are a number of these works in museums throughout the world. So the Met has two, um, but it's not uncommon to see these at different places. So perhaps the museum by your house or in your travels, you've come across these Degas Russian dancer scenes. Okay, um, we're getting into the home stretch. As a reminder, we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. We have some satellite organizations joining us, uh, London and New York. So thanks for being here. We give people the opportunity to experience the history and culture, not only of Washington, D.C., of the, of the world. Um, just as a reminder, this is a multi-part series we're doing on the Impressionism at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And our first program was on Manet. And if you missed that, or if you want to watch it again, or if you know anyone else would be interested, there's a recording of it on our YouTube page, which was included in the Zoom information that I sent out for this program. I'll also send out the YouTube link um, subsequently as well. So if you want to check that out and learn all about Manet and his interesting life, you can do so. And then the next program we're going to be doing is on will be on Renoir. I don't have the date for that just yet, but it'll probably be in late December or early January, if I had to guess. So that'll be Renoir and Impressionism at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And then we have another program coming up later this month where we've been going through the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. But instead of focusing on specific artists like the Impressionists, we're focusing on the American art collection. And so part one uh, featured American art up to 1815. And our second part of our program, which is gonna be later this month, is gonna focus on American art from 1815 to 1865. And this program, in addition to talking about art also talks about history and music and literature and kind of how all those things fit together. So it's kind of focused on what we call the American experience. So if you want to join us for that, that'll be taking place on a couple different dates in November. And we also be visiting the Louvre again. We had that program yesterday, but we'll repeat it at some point in time in the future. So you can be on the lookout for that. 
Um, as a reminder, Washington, D.C. History and Culture, we're a nonprofit organization. One of the challenges that we have is, to be perfectly honest with you, is we've been offering all these programs for free, but we could not continue to offer them if we didn't receive some type of support from the community just because we have administrative expenses that we incur. Um, so if you've ever made the donation to support the work we do, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate that. Um, if you ever would like to make a donation to help us in the future, we accept donations via PayPal or Venmo. We would like to keep offering these programs for free so that people don't have to pay to attend them. However, uh, we need some type of support from the community just to keep offering these because of the administrative expenses we incur. So thank you very much for your support. Greatly appreciate that. And let's talk about Degas and sculpture. So perhaps his most famous work is this one, the dancer. Let's talk about her. This is the little 14 year old dancer. Note the date for this, this was cast in 1922. And in the year 2018, they added this clothing item. So this was not original. They added in there just to give it the finished look. And let's talk about this. It has a really fascinating history. There it is on display at the Met. Notice that it's positioned in front of these two dancer paintings we saw earlier. And everyone loves the Degas dancer, not just Marilyn Monroe, but everybody. So it's one of the most well-known artworks in the museum. and really spectacular to see in person. Now, this also has a really fascinating history. Let's talk about that. Um, here's some views of it inside the photography studio, just so you can get a look at it from different perspectives. So one of the great things about how they have this set up in the museum is you can walk around it in 360 degrees. I think people, um, you know, everyone's busy and you go visit museums, there's a lot of stuff to look at. You might be kind of tempted just to walk up, look at the front of this, um, you know, take a selfie and then kind of move on. But if you can take the time to kind of study it in a little more detail and kind of circle uh, around the full thing, kind of like, you know, when you, if you're drinking wine, you just don't chug it down, you need to sniff it and take in the aroma and all that stuff and really kind of immerse yourself in the wine. Uh, well, you should do the same thing with this sculpture just because it's so amazing to look at it from the different perspectives. Like for instance, look at the position of her legs. Um, that's really interesting how far this right leg uh, juts out or the kind of contrast between this foot facing this way, this one facing the other way. Here is the view of the side and the back. Really interesting position of her hands as well that you wouldn't notice if you only looked at it from the front. Add to the bow for her hair. And the side in the front. So this sculpture has a really interesting story. I was talking before about critics and it's so funny that a lot of critics uh, from back in the day, they hated artworks that we are now love. And so this is a good example. When this came out, the critics, uh, so to speak, they hated this sculpture. They did not like it at all. And Degas showed it once and it would receive such a huge negative response he basically just put it away in his studio and he never showed it ever again i think he was kind of hurt and offended um, by the fact that this received such criticism and so when Degas dies this sculpture is really kind of like an afterthought in his career because he had only shown it once uh, during his long career. This was, if you were to walk up to, if you were to show this to people, let's say, um, that were alive the day that Degas died, they wouldn't even know this sculpture. <laughs> it was not uh, widely uh, seen by very many people. In fact, it was pretty much unknown. Now, though, it's his most famous work. And so it's really kind of amazing um, how things change. 
in terms of what we like and our interests and our preference. Well, um, the reason why the critics of the day did not like it because uh, for a variety of reasons, number one, they just thought it was not, she was not worthy of a sculpture. And what I mean by that is typically sculptures throughout history have been important people like kings and um, philosophers and great thinkers and politicians and leaders and stuff like that. And who is Degas? He's making, he's wasting time and effort on a sculpture of this dancer girl, like who we don't even know who she is. I mean, we know who she is now, but they didn't know who she was that time. So they thought that this was kind of a waste of time to even bother making a depiction of her, which is kind of one unusual thing. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a prominent person to be featured in art. And then also too, the fact that she's not idealized. So a lot of people actually, the era, uh, oh, she's not attractive and she's ugly, uh, which is really unusual because I think a lot of people now would say, oh no, she's beautiful and graceful and elegant. Um, but you know, it's just kind of a way how our interests and our preference um, and things like that change over time. So really kind of unusual to me <laughs> that the critics really gave this one the big thumbs down, um, so to speak. And now this is so popular and so loved. And this Degas, he would just, if he could come back to life and see how much people love this artwork, he would be stunned uh, because just the one time he showed it, he just received this huge firestorm of criticism, uh, people hating this. And so he put it back in his studio and when they uh, found it and when he died and went into you know it's covered in dust and hadn't been <laughs> shown before um, he would just really be astounded if he realized that this was his most popular or famous work so really kind of unusual uh, story in that regard really a lot of great details the dancer uh, they know a little bit about her her name was Marie um, but they don't know a lot about her. They know that she was Dutch. Um, she came from a very poor family herself, like a lot of dancers. She, uh, her father passed away when she was a young girl. Her mother worked as a laundress um, and she was a dancer herself, Marie. And at some point in time, she left the, the dancing scene, so to speak. And she just kind of like dropped off the face of the earth. A lot of people have spent time trying to uh, research her life and find out what happened to her afterwards. And they know some of the details, but they just kind of um, went off into obscurity. It was uh, easier for people to kind of be anonymous back then than it is today uh, with all the electronic trails that we have now. So really interesting. Um, initially, this was a wax figure and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. has the wax original. When Degas died, his estate went through and took a lot of his wax sculptures and made uh, molds of them, which they then in turn made bronze sculptures from. So this sculpture was not created during Degas' lifetime. It was created afterwards, and it's a copy of the wax original that he made, which is at the Metropolitan Museum, or, or which is at the National Gallery of Art, sorry, in Washington, DC. But that being said, this is one of the first bronze editions that was cast. And this was initially shown by Degas in 1881. <laughs> so kind of imagine, uh, crazy to think that 40 years later, when he died, uh, this kind of resurfaces and ends up becoming getting this life of its own. The Dega dancer. Really interesting hand position in the back. So she came to his studio on a number of occasions and posed for him. He did uh, drawings and sketches of her before he actually did the sculpture. And one of the reasons why her name has been lost to history um, is because, again, this, this sculpture does not become famous or well known until decades after he first created. He did the initial work in uh, 1880 and this was not started to become to prominence until the 1920s so you can see why so much time had passed by um, between the time she posed and by the time this became a well-known artwork it's likely that she was not even alive uh, when this came into the public's eye so that kind of creates a problem for people trying to find out more about her and who she is. But she knows she, she was a real dancer. Her name was Maria. Um, her family was Dutch. Her father passed away when she was a young girl. Her mom was very poor, trying to support uh, Marie and her younger sister. Her mom worked as a laundress. Remember, we were talking about that profession before. It's close up at the bottom. 
this uh, sculpture is 38 and a half inches tall. Someone asked about that. Not counting the base. And then this was added later. This is known as the tutu part of her outfit. That was added later to kind of give you the full effect of how um, she would have looked. So really amazing if you were to ask people to describe this sculpture uh, in a word today, unlike the critics of Degas' time who hate it, you know, people talk about uh, poise and grace and elegance and strength uh, and things like that uh, when they used to describe this word. It kind of is similar to the girl sculpture that's in New York City on Wall Street. I should have put up a picture of those two side by side. So you can see that if you know the one I'm referring to. And there you have it, Degas dancer. So Degas, here is a sculpture of him by another artist. He was very um, influential. A lot of artists took inspiration from him. Here's a sculpture that was made of him, age of 72. Give you a sense of what he looked like as an older man. He was a little bit, um, I guess you would say ornery. Uh, and opinionated later in life. He did have a number of friends when he was younger, um, but as he got older, he kind of became like a grumpy old man, so to speak, and ended up actually severing a lot of his friendships he had with people. So he became much more kind of, um, I don't know, outspoken and controversial later in life. Again, he was born in 1834, he died in 1917. He's buried in a family grave in a cemetery in Paris. The Degas name is spelled sometimes as two words, uh, as you can see here, Degas, and then sometimes the way Degas did himself as one word. It's the family Degas crypt in Paris. Here's the portrait of him. And then just as kind of a recap, these were some of the things that we were talking about. So Degas born 1834, he died in 1917. The subjects he did, the dancers were about half of his works he created. He also did a lot of the scenes of modern Paris life uh, in terms of the forms he used to create this artwork, he did oil paintings, he did a lot of pastels. And then what's really interesting, the sculpture. Uh, in fact, his most well-known work is perhaps that dancer sculpture. There's not a lot of other impressionists that also did sculpture. Um, Renoir did a few and Gauguin did a few. So Degas, uh, really interesting. He's kind of like Deion Sanders, uh, if you're familiar <laughs> with football. Not only was he a great oil painter, also was a great sculptor. He was able to do both of those things. And then kind of some things that are characteristic of his style. We talked about the unique perspective and the cropping. Those are paramount. Also the draftsmanship. Uh, we talked a lot about that and the colors that he used. Um, he didn't do the painting outdoors thing like a lot of the other Impressionists did. Um, he didn't consider himself an Impressionism. In fact, he did not like that word at all. He considered himself a realist, meaning that he was depicting uh, modern Paris as it really was. And on a personal note, he was from a wealthy family, which meant he didn't have to rely on the sale of his artwork to support himself. He had a very private life. We actually don't know a lot about Degas' Um, private life in terms of his romantic involvement and things like that. He was very, very um, um, uh, adamant that people should not know about his private life for whatever reason. And he was never married. And as far as we know, he never had any children. And so that's kind of the recap of Degas, just to kind of go through visually and look at the artworks we explored at the Met. They really just have an amazing collection of his paintings and sculptures, uh, something for you to check out. So these were the early works we saw. And the ones that I'm showing you today, these are the majority of his works, but the Met actually has quite a few other works that we just didn't have time to look at today, just because of the sense of time. These were some early portraits of friends of his, the early dancer paintings, which characterized by the large number of dancers and also the creepy guys in the background, the scenes of modern or contemporary 
urban city life in Paris. The later dancer paintings, usually solitary figures or small groups of dancers. The nude pastels. And you have the Russian or Ukrainian dancers. And the famous dancer sculpture. He did a number of other sculptures that they have in the collection at the Met. Just for sake of time, we didn't have a chance to explore those in this particular program, perhaps someday in the future. And that's the end of our program. So that's a wrap. Thanks so much for joining us. As they say in France, merci, and hope you have a great rest of your Sunday and a great rest of your weekend. Stay safe and hope to see you at some point in time in the future. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Hope you learned a little bit more about Degas, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Impressionism, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe. Take care. Bye.